welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and today we are going to be rejoining Patrick Lacey for part two of our conversation. If you missed part one, all you need to do is head back one episode to 219. In that episode, we chat with Patrick about growing up in a haunted house, his latest book, Bone Saw, Sleep Paralysis, and a lot, lot more. But, as always, you can listen to these conversations in any order, so by all means, listen to part two first, and then head back to 2.19 once you're done. Before we get into the conversation, let us have a quick word from our sponsors. Do you like Stephen King? Do you like podcasts of Stephen King? Do you like spooky magazines? Good news! Now you can have a St- Stephen King podcast, Castle Rock Radio. And you can have a spooky magazine, Dark Moon Digest. All you have to do, go to www.patreon.com slash PMM Publishing. Have a scary day. Okay, well with that said, here it is. It is part two of the conversation with Patrick Lacey. And now for a horror interview. But I know that you've also worked for a number of other, or, or worked with, I should say. You've worked with a number of other small presses, so you were working with Sinister Grin before. Now, am I right in thinking, was was that for We Came Back? Yeah, so Sinister Grin, uh, pretty closely, I think like four or five months apart from each other, published uh, Dreamwoods, which was originally scheduled through Sam Hain, and then... Um, we came back, which had been sent to Sam Hain, but luckily um, kind of fell through the cracks and then they went under. So I didn't have to do any rights uh, snatching back. So they did. Uh, we came back kind of exclusively. Um, but yeah, those novels were released, I think, within like five months of each other. So it was kind of a whirlwind, if you will. Yeah. And I imagine that We Came Back is perhaps your most personal story. I mean, the proceeds went to a cancer charity, a tribute to your father, and also, I mean, the parallels with the protagonist, Justin, losing his father to cancer in high school as well. Yeah, so it's funny, like a lot of the um, Justin main character stuff, you know, with the the dying father stuff is like very personal, but oddly, like not that hard to write because my dad had passed away when I was 18 and I wrote that novel when I was like 28, maybe. So enough time had passed and I always wanted to tackle that. But I think sometimes if someone's like doing a personal experience novel, it's just you can kind of overdo it and it becomes like too in your face, you know, like this traumatic thing happens to me. So I wanted to distance myself and finally when enough time had passed, like literally a decade, um, the idea for We Came Back uh, came up and I was like, okay, I, I think I can add this portion to the book, but it doesn't sort of have to be the entire story. It can just be one character's experience. And I still have all this other actual not personal stuff to work with, but at least this element, um, I can kind of get that out. It was very therapeutic writing it, but then it was kind of done and it didn't have to um, comprise the entire novel, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it does make sense. But that, uh, yeah, that novel is a charity novel. So all my royalty proceeds go toward, um, the American Cancer Society, which uh, I thought was going to be more technical, but it actually isn't that bad. They send me um, uh, on my royalty statements, like they let me know exactly like what amount Dreamwoods did and what amount we came back. And I just uh, write a check for the American Cancer Society, which is nice. Um, and when that book came out, um, that was kind of one of the dangers of that is like, I didn't want to um, seem like I was, um, how do I put this? like martyr or something. And I was, you know, like I'm doing this for the charity, but I really wanted to donate because of the uh, personal aspect, but it didn't want to seem like sort of preachy. And I, w- I was a little bit worried that people might think that because I, I can kind of get, you know, 
turned off by that sort of thing if someone's overly preaching about a charity, which, you know, all charities are nice or whatever, but if if your charity aspect of a novel is overpowering what the actual novel is, it's, it almost seems a little bit uh, preachy, I guess. So I just wanted people to know, like, my money's going towards this, but, like, I'm not, you know, you can buy the book just because you want to read it or you can buy it because you want to donate to the charity. Either is fine, but I just kind of, you know, I put that part as a caveat in some ways. And I don't think based on, you know, talking to people in the novel's reception that it came across that way, which is nice, because I think there's kind of a fine line with when you're working with a charity type thing like that, if that makes sense. Yeah. What kind of things did you do in terms of the marketing and the promotion with that in mind and in terms of walking that line and being on the right side of it? So that's actually a good point. I um, usually with like, book marketing stuff, I try just to be kind of um, sarcastic, which is just kind of my tendency anyway, trying to make it a little bit fun and come up with unique things. But a week came back, I would definitely say is like the most serious of my novels. And it's funny because, you know, Bonesaw was actually written before then, but it, it's coming out like over a year after we came back. Um, so it's kind of like a different, I'm a much different person now uh, than when that novel was written. But um we came back, I kind of had to be a little bit more serious because of the charity aspect. Um, so I would, you know, post little pictures of like me and my dad from when I was a kid, but I try and post ones that were funny, you know, a lot of like Halloween pictures or, um, um, uh, my dad making like a funny face or something. Cause I didn't want it to be like too depressing if that makes sense. Um, so there, there was a fine line, but I also like, that wasn't the main aspect. Like I think in the last 10 days before the, um, book's release since it's kind of a coming of age novel and um, most of the main characters are in high school or there's high school teachers i would post like my rejected uh, senior photos from uh, high school so i tried to make it funny leading up to it with the caveat that like this is going to be a little bit more serious than i normally am and i think there was a pretty good mix i don't think anybody was too turned off by the seriousness but on the flip side i don't think anyone was like hey pat wrote this um fairly personal book and it's going towards his charity but yet he's just posting stupid pictures of himself uh making funny faces in high school i don't think anybody at least audibly said that out loud to me so i, I think it was a, it was a hard line in terms of promoting that book but I, I think overall it was successful in that regard yeah and what kind of reaction did you get from your family and from friends from back in high school um, yeah, so one of my best friends from high school read the book like right when it came out, and he's actually based on uh, Justin's best friend in there, uh, whose name is Art, which is funny because looking back, I don't know what teenager would be named Art now, but um, he got a kick out of it because there's all sorts of like little inside jokes, and, and and that's another thing is like I changed all this stuff enough that like nobody. Um, would get like offended if something was put in there but also like if they were reading it they might be like oh i think that that's referring to this real life experience but um i've definitely learned from some writers who you know have told me you know this part like actually happened and the person who read it was like very like uh offended that they put it in verbatim so i was very conscious to use my uh high school and the experience of my dad getting sick and passing away but not um to a T. Everything that happens in that was very informed of my senior year of high school, informed by it, but it wasn't uh, exactly how it happened. Uh, so I think that was a good lesson too about learning how to write uh, from trauma and personal stuff, but not making it so real that it becomes a memoir. Because I think people, readers, are can kind of pick up on that. And for some, it might be off-putting because it's kind of like, hi, I'm the writer and this happened to me. And I think your microphone uh, think broke up a bit there when you said, "Oh no, hi, I'm the writer." <laughs> that kind of <laughs> faded out a bit. That's just my new biography. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I think sometimes you run the risk of say, you know basically saying like, "Hi, I'm the writer. This really bad thing happened to me, so I'm going to revolve the novel around it and make it basically more like a mission statement or a memoir." Uh, and I think readers can definitely pick up on that. So I, I just kind of tried to make it as personal as I could without making it um, an autobiography, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah. And of course, Hi, I'm the Writer is the name of your forthcoming autobiography. Yes. Hi, I'm the Writer, a sleep paralysis memoir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just teaching you more about yourself as, as promised. I've become <laughs> self-actualized, I think, after yeah. this. 
I learned more about myself than other people learned about me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a memoir. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we have a question from Scott Kemper, and he says, I know that you have a book coming out that you've co-written with Matt Haywood. I was wondering how you guys collaborated. Who came up with a story idea? How did you collaborate? Did you alternate chapters or do something else? Um, yeah, that was interesting. So Matt Hayward, I had uh, known him online because we'd been published in similar uh, publication. So I guess I'd known him for like a year and I finally met him at uh, Scares That Care. Um, I think this would have been in 2016 and over a few beers at the bar, he kind of pitched me um, the idea for the novel. And at that point, it was just a short story that he'd written. And I don't think he'd ever sent it out because he was kind of felt like there was more to the story than he had given. Um, so we kind of spitballed ideas and we took it in more of like a you know, again, like nightmares and dreams uh, play like a, a very prominent role in this novel. It's called Practitioners. I probably should have opened that. Um, and we just kind of spitballed ideas. And I said, you know what, when in a couple months, because I was wrapping up a novel at that point, I was like, in a couple months when stuff has died down, why don't you send me that first chapter and I'll see, you know, if I can do anything with it. And he did. And I wrote the next chapter and he wrote the next chapter. So basically um, all the odd I don't, I don't know if Matt cares if I say this, but all the odd chapters in the book are uh, Matt and all the even chapters are me, except I think at some point one of us was like on vacation or like another deadline was coming up. So we had to switch. But for the most part, all the odd chapters are him and all the even chapters are me. But then, you know, it becomes sort of a porridge mush of all our influences because then we did a pass each editing the whole thing so i think that helped kind of um because our, our voices are similar but they, they definitely have their differences too but i think by taking a, a, a pass or two each uh after the fact um kind of helps it have a cohesive voice and because of that it's funny like the chapters that i wrote i'll look at and it's just kind of like i can tell i wrote this but it doesn't really sound like my normal thing um and that was kind of one of the great benefits. That's the first time I'd ever collaborated on anything. But um, me and Matt are, are pretty fast writers. So I'd say we do um, at least three or four chapters a week. We'd, we'd throw them back to each other. And we didn't work. I, I don't usually work from an outline anyway, but we didn't have like really any sort of outline. And halfway through the book, um, stuff starts really getting crazy. And I think that was us trying to kind of one up the other. Um, and so he just add like this crazy because it involves dreams and nightmares. He add you know this crazy scenario where there's this monster or whatnot that I hadn't seen coming. We hadn't discussed beforehand, and I would be like, okay, if you're doing this, then I'm going to take it one step further. And I think that really kind of challenged us to see like how far we could take it in terms of um, surrealness. But um, yeah, it was just easy as easy as just sending a chapter back and forth and, and taking it from there. I think the whole thing probably took four months it, it was very organic and it was very it was a quick process so yeah i think the sign of a good collaboration is if upon reading it the reader just has no idea who wrote which part and it sounds like because you all had i say you all there's two of you because you both had a pass each editing it and because you went back and forth that you know you've done your job there yeah, the, the funniest part about that, and this again might be a little like peek behind the curtains, is um, since we didn't really discuss it beforehand and we just kind of, you know, we had this one chapter to work with as a starting point, um, I just assumed for whatever reason, it's basically like more of a crime police procedural. And then it, as the novel goes on, it becomes, you know, more uh, supernatural, more uh, horrific, I guess. But um, I just assumed that the novel took place in Ireland because Matt Hayward is from Ireland, is an Irish writer. And about halfway through, um, he kind of was like, you know, this is supposed to take place in like a southern United State, right? In like Tennessee. And I was like, no, I did not know that. So I had to go back and rework some of the dialogue. And I don't know if that was because 
just his voice rubbing off on me, but I definitely saw, like, this guy sounds like he's from Dublin and not uh, Kentucky or something. Uh, so I still, to this day, don't know why I assumed it took place in Ireland, but it was kind of a wake-up call. Uh, and I did, you know, for for one, you know, horrifying moment, be like, do I need to rework this whole thing? But it, it turned out to be fine, and I just, just needed some light editing for, you know, dialect and stuff. But definitely for the first half of the book, I was convinced we were writing an Irish crime horror novel, so. That was probably the sensible way to go about it. I mean, the other way would have been for the protagonist to be confronted by someone, maybe like a barman, and it's like, dude, you realize you're not in Dublin, and then he has this breakdown, and <laughs> he's been thinking he's in Dublin all along, but he's actually in Tennessee, and it's just this weird, almost veering on existential crisis. I think that would have been better, but... You know, it was funny because I had him saying, like, they called beers pints. They called the bar either a pub or a local. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so maybe Matt didn't pick up on that because that's just how he would refer to it in Ireland anyway. Um, but I think I do believe I had the main character. Um, I wrote a little bit of his backstory as saying, like, his parents came over from Ireland when he was very young to get it as a scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in case there was any like Irish stuff that I, I forgot to like take out so hopefully I caught it all um, because I just did like a final pass on that I think like last month or something and it, I didn't nothing glaring came out to me but just in case it did uh, there is a safety net there so yeah yeah I like that it's like dude why are you ordering a pint oh didn't I tell you that my dad came from <laughs> Ireland <laughs> You're like, oh, okay, that's legit. That checks yeah. out. It's like I just kind of do that as a little tribute to him every now and then. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, our next Patreon question is from Thomas Joyce, and he says, if you were to reboot any classic horror movie franchise in novel or novella form, which would it be and why? Oh, interesting. Reboot in written form um well the obvious choice i guess would be nightmare on elm street and i'm not talking about like remaking it in terms of like that awful remake that came out in 2010 that i literally pretend doesn't exist but um sorry anybody who likes it out there i'm sure you're a nice person despite that um i just think it would be excellent you know I, i've seen nightmare on elm street that franchise literally hundreds of times and it's just my favorite set of movies of all time especially the first one for obvious reasons. So I think it would just be just nearly like fan fiction, you know, it would bring me back to where I was in like second or third grade writing, you know, Drawer and Freddy with speech bubbles, making my own Nightmare on Elm Street comics to be able to play, um, play in that s sandbox, I guess. And I, I would hope that having seen these movies, you know, collectively hundreds of times, I'd have a pretty good sense of, um, of the world and world building and such and the mythology. But, you know, in that regard, there are so many, Freddy Taya novels and novelizations, many of which I have on the shelf next to me because I'm obsessed. I should mention too, on my left, I am staring at a six foot Freddy Krueger uh, cutout that's in the corner of my office. So in case you were questioning my Freddy fandom, about 50% of my office right now is Nightmare on Elm Street. But um, yeah, if I ever got, you know, I'm always like interested in novelizations and media tie-ins. So that's kind of like a goal for me someday is maybe to dip my toes in that uh, aspect of the industry but uh, nightmare on elm street definitely uh comes to mind for sure and then the other one isn't really a movie or it is but it, it's uh based on a video game property and that would be um silent hill i'm so obsessed with those games some of my favorite games of all time i uh, love the first movie i despise the second one even though malcolm mcdowell's in it it's a, a, a treasure but um I think that would be so interesting to, to work within those confines. And I think it would be a good fit for me too, because a lot of my stuff um, kind of minus bone saw is, um, you know, more supernatural and uh, nightmarish and surreal um, where, you know, the reality is not always set in stone. So I think that would be a good fit sort of with my writing sensibilities. And I don't think from the research I've done, there's too much um, tie in work with silent Hill. I don't think there's even like um, a novelization of the movie, uh, but it would be a moot point, I guess, to, to get hired to write a novelization of a 10-year-old movie, I guess. But um, those two, I always kind of daydream about, like, what would I do with those franchises? And I think I'd be able to at least um, take them in some sort of interesting direction that maybe hasn't been done before. But like I said, with Freddy, that'd be even harder because 
if you look up Freddy Krueger tie-in novels in um, just books in general on eBay, there's like hundreds of them. There's even like a series of YA novels from the mid nineties that are uh, um, Freddy Krueger related, but definitely those two off the top of my head would be uh, first choice. So if any publishers are listening. Well, yeah. as long term <laughs> listeners of the podcast know, I'm a huge Silent Hill fan. And yeah, mm -hmm. yeah there, ha there haven't been any novelizations, but there were some graphic novels in 2004 mm. and 2000 oh, okay. 2005. And I think maybe there were even a few issues that were a little later than that. But I didn't even know about that. I shouldn't do some research because that I'm, I'm obsessed with Silent Hill. So somehow that slips through my my fandom cracks, if you will. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm obsessed with it, too. And, you know, like, I'll, I'll buy a book or watch a film if I feel it might even have a Silent Hill-like atmosphere to it. It doesn't oh, even absolutely. have to be associated mm -hmm. with Silent Hill. It's like, if I can get any of that magic back, then I'm all in. And, I mean, of course, I was most upset when they cancelled Silent Hills, and I I just hope that they, you know, <laughs> reconsider at some point. I mean, they're not going to do it for a few years, but, I mean, from the demo I was that just they released... Say, have you it, seen the, the PT demo? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, ex exactly. And, I mean, it needs to be made, and... I mean, I I always go back and forth as to whether Silent Hill or Resident Evil is my favorite video game franchise because I think they're both very good, but yeah, they're very both different. they're yeah exactly they're good for very different reasons. But I, I, think I, I would go, go yeah yeah I would say that Resident Evil Seven is the closest Resident Evil we've had to having something a little silent hill about it it was much more tense and of course a lot darker than any resident evil that we've seen in recent years particularly given that with resident evil 4 it went in a more action oriented direction but well that's my complaint with the franchise is like the first three are definitely more like survival horror but the fourth one, when it starts, I, I think seems like it's going in more of a general horror direction. And as it goes on, it just almost becomes like a Metal Gear Solid game with monsters. But right. the new one, like you said, it's definitely closer, as close, I think, as we've come to like a Silent Hill vibe in a game. But even still, without spoiling it, like um, as you get on and on and you kind of see the parallels to the franchise. Because at first, when you play it, you don't really know how it connects to the mythology. But I feel like when they start connecting it more and more, it kind of becomes an action game and pulls the same thing that Resident Evil 4 did, albeit like much later in the game, which is good. But it's a little bit different with Silent Hill because I, I really only like the first three Silent Hill games. I do like four, but it's kind of, I, I think it's starting to degrade in quality. And then, you know, the, the next generation consoles when those came out, you know, I've tried to other places. Uh, Silent Hill games, you know, on like PlayStation 3 and whatnot, Homecoming and all that. And they just like fail to capture the absolute like existential dread. Like basically the first three Silent Hill games are like an, a sleep paralysis in progress. And I don't think anything's really come close to that in video games. Because um, I've at least tried most of the horror franchises and they, they just don't capture that, unfortunately. The only thing I can uh, think of is like the Amnesia games where you kind of just like it's not really about combat really, but it's just a nightmarish surreal quality going on. But right. I, I just, since those first three Silent Hill games, nothing has really come close to I, capturing that. I think if you're a fan of Amnesia, then you'll also like the Outlast series, which I would say are arguably scarier than Silent Hill, but I prefer Silent Hill and I prefer Resident Evil 7 because whilst they have moments of absolute dread and terror, what makes it scarier is you have downtime. You have yes. times where you feel, if not safe, something nearer to that. Whereas with Outlast, I mean, it, it, it's all just unrelenting. And 
you know, I, I think there's a lot to be said for contrast. And, I mean, e even within music, maybe that's why I prefer, like, more progressive and experimental death metal to just straight-up death metal, because then you've got different things going on, and it actually elevates the more extreme moments. That's why I love black metal so much, especially, like, more modern black metal. is like, more experimentation has come oh, into it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you can just kind of put it on in the background and, and listen where you want to, but it's also just kind of there. Whereas, you know, I, I love like the sort of classic Norwegian black metal too, but uh, A, it has, you know, those seminal albums have aged pretty poorly, especially the recording quality. Obviously, that's the aesthetic they were going for, and a lot of bands still do that, but um, it really doesn't kind of hold my attention that much. I'll listen to a few songs, really dig it, and then it sort of fades into the background. But like, said if there's something more uh, melodic one moment and heavy the next it definitely like captures my attention more and it's just like more of an experience um yeah but that's not to say i don't like the brutal stuff too but overall if, if i have the choice i'm going a little bit more on the experimental side so yeah and i mean anyone who knows me i mean don't get me wrong i love a bit of day aside a bit of morbid angel and cannibal yes. corpse but i think yeah, in terms of perhaps something more layered and textured, I'm really enjoying Wolves in the Throne Room. I'm enjoying oh, Shining. So good. Wolves in the Throne Room. I saw them uh, a few years ago, and they played outside at an abandoned um, like mill building in this like dead-end space in between two buildings. It was like the dead of night. They had all these people go up and hang like candles and hold candles out of the windows. And like there were hundreds of candles lit. And it was literally one of the best experiences seeing a show of all time. They were incredible. That sounds incredible. That's yeah. Yeah. But they can do no wrong, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're a band that aren't afraid to experiment and to release an album that's completely different from what came before it. And I, I think you do see that more within the black metal scene. And in fact, you do see bands that start off black metal and then just become something else entirely. I mean, one that's coming to mind is Over. Oh, sure, yeah. Well, even Opeth, right? Like, they started out more on the black metal side and now... Oh, I, I, Michael Ackerfeld will do what the fuck he wants. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. That is true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he's on record saying that the next album is going to be different than the last. I mean, they're changing their style again. So, you know, there's there's no telling. I, and I love that because you get that same aesthetic, but you get yes. a different style. Uh, and they, they've been on the same kind of kick since, you know, I guess heritage when it comes to Opeth, you know. Right. Uh, and it, 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 I think it culminated in, you know, uh, Sorceress, which I love. Yes. But, uh, you know, their older stuff is is pretty damn cool, too. You That's know? The, one oh, of the reasons yeah. I like Mastodon so much. Not that they were ever black metal, but you have this band that, like, was a very heavy, fast sludge metal band. And now mm -hmm. they're Mastodon. Like, they're kind of their own thing. But when you listen to a Mastodon album, no matter, like, how different it is from the one prior, it just aesthetically, like, it sounds like Mastodon. And I think I think so few bands can pull that off as well as they do. They could literally put out a polka album, and I would buy it on day one. It's, I love that band so much. And I think that's kind of the epitome of, like, finding ways to do things a little bit different but still keeping that signature mastodon sound yeah right and, they're one of my favorite bands i love them oh my god they're so great yeah mastodon's a great example of evolving and changing in terms of musical style because as you say they started off as a more kind of sludgy just wall of sound yes. metal band and then with crack the sky i felt like okay they're their journey into progressive music has reached its height. This is their kind of epic prog album. Where, right. where, the, where the hell can they go from here? And it's like, oh, okay. They're going to just now completely dial it back. And 
go for more of a rocky route whilst maintaining their sound signature. I mean, they're, they're a good example of a band who can release albums that sound completely different whilst at the same time unmistakably Mastodon. They, I always say they're like the Stephen Graham Jones of metal because Stephen Graham Jones can do anything he wants, but like it's always just Stephen <laughs> Graham Jones. Um, and so I think I just I when I think of Mastodon, I think of Stephen Graham Jones. I don't know why, but I don't that just there's something about like their work ethic or like their voice that says like I'm gonna take a complete 180, but you're still gonna know it's me just by reading it or listening to it. Yeah, I think as a fan of both Stephen Graham Jones and Mastodon, both should take it as a compliment. Because oh, of absolutely. course we know that Mastodon listened to the podcast, obviously. <laughs> so <laughs> They do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We hope they do. They're, they're listening <laughs> right now, Bob. I mean, that's like one of, the, one of their perks. <laughs> they get to just listen live. Hi, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think Troy is giving you a little wave there. Cool. Have either of y'all, I'm sure you have because you've experienced the game, but have you experienced the full soundtrack of the original Silent Hill? Yeah. yeah. Yes, I have. I have it on CD. (laughs) Me too. Oh, my God. But that's a weird one, too, because, like, the the music is creepy, right? But it also has this, like, odd... um, I don't want to say like poppiness, but like brightness that kind of contrasts the game, if that makes sense. And it makes it Mm -hmm. for that reason, even creepier because it's not just like, it's not Halloween sound effects. You know what I mean? It's like Mm -hmm. full orchestrated like band stuff, but there's this weird like dichotomy that like further gets under my skin that I don't think any other video game soundtrack has quite done. Right. And the ambient drone stuff is just, uh, it's, it's, Oh man, it's it's very difficult to write to without getting creeped out. I tell you that because you know I think some of those tracks are, you know, they remind you of the game and and you you kind of get lost in it and you're just like Phew. that first game. And I'm like you, I'm like I like the first three, yeah. uh, but the first one is just such a classic. It's just uh, you know I remember playing it and getting to the part at the beginning and he kept dying and I, and I didn't realize that was part of the story. So on my PS one, I kept hitting reset, you know, <laughs> and after the I third just... time I was like, I can't get past them. You know, and I threw the controller down and then hit reset. And then the next, you know, the cut scene started. I was like, Oh, I was supposed to die. Uh, <laughs> I didn't realize that. <laughs> it was a hell of a start to a game though. And that's one oh, of the definitely. few games where, like, I was too slow. Like, I eventually played it again, but I rented it when it first came out. And, like, you know, you're walking through the fog, and then you enter. I think you enter the hospital first, and then you go down a corner, mm-hmm. and it gets darker and darker, and stuff's getting weird really quick. And it was, like, just too much for me to handle. Uh, even though I think it was oh, I was probably in, like, fourth or fifth grade when that came out. Um, but I eventually picked it back up and, you know, got all the way through it. And, man, is that game just literally life-changing. I think that's the game, too. I may be wrong, but I think one of the funny things, if I'm not mistaken, was that I didn't realize that you could take the map with you. Uh-huh. So I'd have to make my way back to where I found the map to look at the map. <laughs> Bob, what the fuck? I, I'm, I'm serious. That's impossible. Man. That is brilliant. <laughs> no, oh my God. No. That's like... That's like adding, like finding a new harder difficulty and unlocking yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, shit, mob difficult. I just like Let the idea of there. you like getting like your notepad out and you're like, right, I'm gonna draw that and then have it next to me. I'm gonna be <laughs> so smart. Be <laughs> yeah. That's a new level on games now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Bob Castrello level. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a difficulty setting. Yes. Leave the map there. Yeah. <laughs> Make your way back. <laughs> Pen and paper is necessary for this level. <laughs> I'm going to have to try that. I haven't played that game in probably a decade, but I think I'm going to try it on the, the Bob uh, difficulty I, level. I think, And I think that's the one. Uh, I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure a lot of those games that came out, you know, golly, they're like 15, what, 15, 20 years old. 
Yep. So, you know, your memory kind of morphs and things, and I, but I'm pretty sure that's the one that I kept, you know, and I think it was my uh, one of my friends that said, you know, you could take the map with you. And I'm like, <laughs> you fucking liar. And they're like, no, take it. It says take map. <laughs> you know, and I was like, okay, take. And I'm like, oh, wow, I can carry it around with me. And then you Sweet. beat it like 20 minutes later with the map. You're like, this isn't that hard of a game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I've been on the first level for a month now. Fuck. <laughs> How big is this hospital? <laughs> I just like the idea that you were being considerate. It's like, do you want to take the map? And you're like, oh, this is a pretty creepy town. I mean, what if someone else comes by? Like, they could really get value out of that map. Now, I better leave the map. Oh, so you were just being a nice person. Yeah, so yeah. That's what it was. No, nah, I wasn't being nice at all. <laughs> I just didn't know any better. Yeah. <laughs> I was kind of new to video games, too. So, you know, it's like it was like the first time I ever played Duke Nukem, you know, the third person one, not the shooter. But, you know, I think oh, it was yeah. Planet of the Babes. Yes. You know, and you spend like, I was like, so I kept. I got to, you know, I had to dive underwater, get the crystals and all that. And, it, and I thought, OK, I beat the game. Yeah. And it goes to another level. I'm like, what the hell is this? There's like that whole other game, you know, and I didn't know. So I went and uh, I got the guide, you know, because I, I I went to like the local game place and I said, hey, do y'all have like a book or something for this? Because I'm kind of confused. I'm new to games. So, you know, what what's the deal here? And the guy explained to me. And I said, yeah, because I went to a whole other level. And he's like, well, you know, there's like 13 more. <laughs> every game, every and game like, is one level. <laughs> And I'm like, huh? What? Huh? Really? Let me. Can I get that guy? How much is that? You know, <laughs> so I got that guy, and uh, it was just like, oh man, that and siphon filters, and uh, you know, and, oh, and uh, what was nice. it? Driver. Yeah. yeah. So I'm many, uh, so many games, you know, that were ruined whenever they, you know, we upgraded it. Now it's on PlayStation Two, and you're just like, no, 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 no. <laughs> But you know that you can just play the original. Like, if they upgrade it, that doesn't mean you have to get the upgraded I need version. a workable PS1 to do that. That's the issue. Ah, ah. Or a PS3. You can play PS1 games on PS3. Right. And I need PS2, a workable... Actually. Yeah, the problem is I have a PS3. It does work, but for some reason it will not con- get online, so I cannot upgrade any software. So it locks me up anytime I try to play a game. Yeah, that's... So, yeah, I may end up having to probably get another PS3 one day. Right. Because I I have the orange box, which is, you know, Half-Life 2 and all those and Portal. And that's, you know, extremely uh, difficult. Plus, also, Dead Space, another... Oh, so good. Yeah, another uh, awesome game there. Welcome to the This Is Video Game Podcast. (laughs) Well, I was I was just thinking that, but e- equally, like long term <laughs> listeners know that it's like basically the magic words are either Silent Hill or Resident <laughs> Evil, and it's like, oh for fuck's sake, we set them <laughs> off for at least twenty minutes now. Like, probably wow, they like really nerded out this episode. Yeah. Oh but- no, I've already gotten messages from people that as soon as that Resident Evil Two remake okay. trailer came out, I got private messages from people saying, you know, Michael. I said, well, I'm just waiting on him to bring it up. So. <laughs> I did it before you now. Huh. Who, who the fuck is private messaging you about me bringing up Resident Evil 2? <laughs> it was me. No. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, now that we brought it up, though. No, I'm, 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 I mean, this is difficult. I'll probably start sweating. I'm trying not to talk about that, Bob. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> he's, uh, he's trying so hard, he's sweating. Yeah. He's like, no. Oh. Must not. Must continue. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't know if you've played them, Pat, but the Evil Within and the Evil Within 2, I felt that was as if the creator of Resident Evil made a Silent Hill game. I think that's as near to that as we've got. And actually, as much as I like the Evil Within, I'd probably say that the Evil Within 2 was even better and I oh, think, for sure. Yeah, I think for the first three chapters, maybe four chapters, it's almost like an open world game. I mean, you can really explore the town, and I think a lot of that had something Silent Hill about it. I well, spent... that was my main complaint. 
complaint is that after that, it becomes less open world. There's like a little smidgen of it that gets more so in the end, but not to the yeah. degree that the first four chapters were. And that's kind of, it just kind of fell downhill for me because if the whole game had been open world like that, um, like you said, it, it had such a Silent Hill vibe, maybe a little bit more action-y, but um, yeah, they kind of dropped the ball for me. That's not to say the rest of the game wasn't good, but it just it held my attention um, for for the most part in those first few chapters because they were just so good, so much to explore. Yeah, I, I guess, like, I mean, I'm a fan of the open-world video game, but I'm also equally a fan of games where I guess they more pigeonhole the direction in which you're going so because of that like it wasn't too much of a concern for me but I do see what you're saying and you know thinking about it it's almost like they wanted to dip their feet into both worlds but they didn't want to fully commit it's like is this an open world game is this more a linear survival horror and well it's, it seems like most people dug like us, those first four open world parts to it. So hopefully they'll get the memo on the next one and make it entirely open world, assuming there is a, a third one, because this one I think was like a blockbuster video game. So I think it made tons of money. So fingers crossed. Yeah, I mean, obviously, if they made a third one and it's all open world, it's going to be a lot harder to make. But I think... Then this, 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 this finally brings the conversation back to writing and back to art. But, <laughs> I mean, just because... I mean, it, it, it's going to be harder, but surely that's the point. It's like, you know, you want to do something better. You want to do something more worthwhile. And so it's going to be better putting that work in, putting that time in and knowing that you've created something really special. And in fact, if they do that, then they're also going to differentiate it from all the other horror games that are out there right now. And there are quite a few cropping up. It's a good time to be a video gamer and a horror fan. Oh, yeah. There's so many different just media in general coming out that's horror themed um, now more than ever. Just you got books, movies, games, just a mm -hmm. constant flow of it. A lot of it not that good. Uh, but a lot of it is is quality stuff. Um, it's, it's a good time to be alive. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Well, switching gears, what frightens you? Um, other, th other than my childhood home. Right. Um, I guess, like, um, just, I have this weird, like, I, I'll always read, like, sort of, like, um, stuff like the, uh, what's it called? The Mandela effect, you know? So... Uh, a lot of people like collectively remember something that may have not happened or they remember um, something that happened differently. And it's called the Mandela effect because, you know, like something like 40 percent of people who were polled about um, Nelson Mandela seem to remember him passing away in, um, in prison in the 70s or 80s, which in fact didn't happen. He got released and became, you know, the figure he was known for until he finally passed away. Um, but there's a lot of like little things things like that and the most recent one is the Berenstein Bears which is a, is a really stupid trivial thing but a lot of people remember um, the the kids book series Berenstein Bears being the Berenstein Bears but I believe it's actually the Bernstein Bears or I might have that flipped um, but you know there's a lot of things like that a lot of people remember in the 90s there being a really popular um, uh, like a kids genie film with Shaquille O'Neal uh, in it mm -hmm. but in fact doesn't exist so all these little things, and again, they're trivial, and why would reality, you know, if reality kind of became, like, um, self-aware, why would it, like, switch and mess with us on these little tiny points? But there's enough of them um, to kind of get under my skin, and it kind of, like, my mind will almost be like an existential crisis. We're like, okay, if this is different and it's changed and we're kind of a little bit aware of it, what else taking that theory and assuming it's real, what else has changed that we're not aware of? And for some reason that like goes down a wormhole of like existential dread. Um, so I actually try not to read up about that, even though it fascinates me. Um, but yeah, it's just sort of like how well do we actually know reality and is it as static as we think and hope it to be? I don't really want to know the answer. It goes back to, you know, I don't want to film, myself sleeping and see something standing there because 
now that if you know the truth, how do you like move past that? Can you even can you even like live a productive life knowing the truth? Um, so it kind of goes against the whole concept of the X Files. It's like they're searching, and the truth is out there. I'm sure the truth is out there with this stuff. I just don't want to know it because even comprehending the truth is enough to make me give me the creepy crawlies. So I guess I'd say the Berenstein Bears are my biggest fear. So. I didn't even know about this Shaquille O'Neal film, which doesn't actually exist. <laughs> so maybe that's why I didn't know about it. But no, I'm, the, I'm looking, the thing is I'm that the Shaquille O'Neal film does exist. Everybody thought that Sinbad, the comedian Sinbad, had done a movie called Shazam. Oh, okay. But Shaquille O'Neal did a movie called Kazam. Oh, yes, yes, that's right. Okay, but everybody thinks that Sinbad did it. Sinbad's like, I didn't do a new fucking movie. That's <laughs> okay. Well, I don't, maybe it didn't exist because I'm looking at Kazam now and it's on IMDb. It's got mm-hmm. two, 2.9 and I don't, <laughs> and then like, if you look at... Out of 10? <laughs> yeah, if you look at, <laughs> if you look at awards, it says Stinker Award nominee, worst supporting actor, Stinker Award, worst on screen hairstyle. And then, as you may know, with IMDb, they have like uh, like memorable quotes, and the, and so the name of the film is Kazam, and then the quote is, "I am Kazam." So I thought, oh, wow. I thought, well, <laughs> I thought, well, surely this doesn't really exist, but I, I don't know, but this IMDb page is funny whether it does or does not exist i i I hadn't even heard of this before but new new theory maybe the film was so bad that the government some shadowy organization made it their mission to erase it from our collective minds because they were so ashamed of it ever existing that's my new theory that's called the kazam effect yeah but how did they get sinbad in shazam to that is that is that their is that their method of erasing it is they, they're, they they're substitute it for something else they're still working out the kinks but yeah because i mean sinbad was kind of like unaware of it but i didn't you know it would be weird in about a year he'd be like well you know i did that film you know shazam <laughs> he's just gonna start <laughs> like, up to it right and be like what the fuck man <laughs> wow that's a, that's some pretty deep uh Story ideas. Oh. Just fell down the wormhole hard there. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have to try and find Kazam just so I can watch it to be sure that it's real. But, like, I mean, <laughs> I can even see, like, extracts now from interviews with Shaq. And, like, everything seems a bit weird about it. So it says the film grossed $18.9 million against a $20 million budget. In a 2012 interview with GQ magazine, O'Neill said, I was a medium-level juvenile delinquent from Newark who always dreamed about doing a movie. Someone said, hey, here's $7 million. Come in and do this genie movie. (laughs) (laughs) And that's where where that quote ends. Like, it all just seems weird. (laughs) Like, the fucking memorable quote, Kazam, I am Kazam. Great. That's actually the only piece of dialogue in the entire film. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You would be better off watching, uh, getting on YouTube and watching uh, reruns of Mad TV and Ari Spears imitating Sha- uh, Shaquille O'Neal. Oh, Aaron. of course. Yeah. You would be better off doing that, Michael. I'm just telling you right now. Okay. <laughs> okay, duly noted. Oh, my God. That was amusing. I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't even know how that <laughs> happened. I asked. I asked you, what frightened you? I we could. Wound up at I could O'Neal. not have anticipated <laughs> that we would get to Shaquille O'Neal as a genie. That's just how life works, man. You're just gonna let it happen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, what is the worst writing advice that you've ever heard? Oh, that's interesting. One. Um. I don't know. I think writing advice in general, you, you have to take with a grain of salt because what works for, like, for example, like I don't usually outline, 
but like there's some people are so like on one camp outline versus um pantsers it's like whatever works for you and also like if you're that into one you just kind of sound douchey if you're like i i just outline and i could never go by the seat of the pants that's more right uh, just that's not real writing it's like, well, okay, I don't outline, but if I wanted, to, if I sold a novel to a big five publisher based on an outline, I would outline. It's kind of like a whatever fits your working style, but b what fits the situation, I guess. So, with that respect, it's good, you know, it's good to listen to people who have way more experience uh, than you and take the advice. But also, it's not always going to apply to every situation. So, in that regard. Um, I don't know, just most writing advice is good to just, you know, let it simmer, but also don't take it to heart because what works for you um, would definitely not work for someone else. So all of it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's good. And we've said before, you know, don't let writing advice be too prescriptive. It is advice. It is advisory. It's not a commandment. But that's just sort of on the the writing side of thing, like publishing advice, you know, people with more experience usually have some good opinions on stuff. And, you know, if you show them a contract or tell them about like a potential opportunity, usually, you know, you can take that with a little bit less grain of salt, I guess. But in terms of actual writing, it's just everybody's process is so different that there's really no one rule that like can, can single handedly apply to you, I think. Okay, I, I think that is a great caveat, because if you're being given legal advice from a lawyer or an expert, it's probably not a good idea to say, well, that's just your opinion, man. I'm going to just take that with a grain of salt. Or if yes. someone's looking at your publishing contract and they're like, dude, you are giving so many rights away. If you sign that, you're going to be shafted. And you're like, eh. Just legal advice, whatever. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not an outliner, so I'm, I'm going to go my own route. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I wonder, and this could be interesting, because I know you've told us a bit about where you were at this time, but what advice would you give to your 18-year-old self? Oh, interesting. Okay, so at 18, um, yeah, so my dad would have passed away that year. So very like you know traumatic year, a lot of stress. Senior year of high school, not really knowing what I wanted to do. Um, that's interesting. And I had just started writing, not like seriously. I wouldn't take it up too seriously until like college. But I guess I would say like just don't um, don't like plan on your your life like working the way you think it's going to be my uh fiance's uncle has like a really good quote and i'm trying to remember it. it's something like live your plan to live your life as if it's on accident or something like that i'm probably butchering that but um you know i i originally went to school for audio production i wanted to get into the music industry found that i despised it because i don't really it kind of taught me to look at um music like too technically and too like scientific and less like creatively i guess um <clears throat> So while I was in college at that music school, I took an elective that was a creative writing class. And it kind of brought me back to when I used to write in high school. And I was like, oh, like this fits because uh, I have a little bit more creative control and I'm not viewing it too like technically. It's just a thing that I enjoy doing. Uh, but I had no idea, you know, when I was going to school for uh, music, thinking I was going to be a, a sound engineer that I'd get into writing and then um, go to school for English and work an ed editorial job and work in publishing. So I guess it's kind of like, just don't plan on too much and kind of just if something comes your way if something um opportunity comes your way and it seems a little bit scary because it's different than what you're used to um maybe just follow that because good things can come from it so i guess just take life as it comes yeah definitely mm -hmm. I think that's, excellent advice yeah oh yeah well thank you so much for chatting with us this morning it has been a huge amount of fun and i i think that i'd like oh, yeah. to do this again sometime so certainly well, like i said before i'm a huge fan of the podcast it's one of my faves so it's uh truly is uh an honor to be honest it's been excellent well thank you thank you oh yeah i really appreciate you saying that and yeah yeah like i find it surreal when people say that to me because obviously like there are a lot of podcasts that i listen to and favorites that i have so yeah i'm just honored to hear that you're getting so much value from this as horror 
I'm going to listen to this episode so many times, you guys. So many times. <laughs> See what you learn. <laughs> yeah. So maybe it's better not knowing. Yeah, yeah. Well, where can our listeners connect with you? Um, you can find me on Facebook. Uh, I am more active on Twitter, so it's at Pat Lacey. And uh, on Instagram, I think it's Patrick C. Lacey. So I'm on those two probably a little bit more than Facebook. And then you can uh, get Bonesaw through Amazon. It's on uh, paperback or ebook. You can also get it directly through Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing. Um, I think that's just their, their website, .com, but you can just Google it and find them. Uh, but that's where you can find me unless you just want to show up at my house unannounced while I'm having sleep paralysis. That's another way, too. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that your fiancé will be happy with that route as well, seeing as she <laughs> has a sleep paralysis where she imagines it. It's like, well, well it's, now you don't have to. It's, it's a me. load of Patrick Lacey fans in your bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't really do that. <laughs> Well, do you have any final thoughts that you would like to leave our listeners with? Um... Yes, if you're a parent and you have like an inkling of desire to want to let your five-year-old watch Nightmare on Elm Street, I say go for it because what's the worst that can happen? Okay, well, as, there you go. as a new parent with two-month-old daughter, I will bear that in mind when she turns five. <laughs> Keep me posted. <laughs> Happy fifth birthday. <laughs> it's Freddy <laughs> Krueger. <laughs> and <laughs> she's been taken off me. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It's a good five years. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to our conversation with Patrick Lacey. Please join us again next time when we will be chatting with Taddy Thompson. But if you want to get that ahead of the crowd, all you need to do is become our patron over at www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. It is the best way to support the podcast. It is the best way to ensure that we can continue doing this. We can continue to transition from a weekly show to a show that puts out two episodes per week. And it's going to see us grow. It's going to see the audio improve. It's going to see more conversations, more episodes of Story Unboxed, our Patreon podcast. It's just a good thing. It's a good way to show that you feel that this is horror podcast is bringing value to you and to your life. So if you want to do that, head on over to www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Now, before I wrap up, let us have a quick word from our sponsors. Do you like Stephen King? Do you like podcasts of Stephen King? Do you like spooky magazines? Good news! Now you can have a St Stephen King podcast, Castle Rock Radio. And you can have a spooky magazine, Dark Moon Digest. All you have to do, go to www.patreon.com slash PMM Publishing. Have a scary day! As always, I would like to finish with a quote. And this time, the quote comes from Steven Pinker, who is a cognitive psychologist, but he's also a linguist and popular science author. And if you haven't read any of Steven Pinker's books, you are missing out. And as a fan of This Is Horror, and as somebody who is interested in writing and the craft of writing, I would suggest that you start with either the sense of style, words and rules, or the language instinct. But there's a lot of other great books from Steven Pinker. There's How the Mind Works, and there is Enlightenment Now, the case for reason, science, humanism, and progress. And there is also The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. So please do check out the work of Steven Pinker. There is something for everyone, and I think you'll get an awful lot out of it. So with that said, here is the quote, something to ponder. The language we use influences the way we think. 
the language we use influences the way we think. And that is Steven Pinker. I'll see you in the next episode. But until then, look after yourself. Be good to one another. Read horror and have a great, great day. Be interesting and might make her question what she's got herself into. <laughs> Do you want maybe to I ask won't. her? <laughs> maybe I won't ask her on second thought. You need to wait for her to upgrade from fiance to wife. It's like, well, now, now you're legally in the shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's a fair point. I'll, I'll wait another ten months and then I'll ask her. <laughs> yeah, and and then you play her this podcast, and it's like we did have this conversation. So. <laughs> Oh, that's true. You know what? The funny thing is, she'll probably listen to this when it goes live. So, um, don't answer me, Emily. Okay, don't give me an answer. Yeah. I've got to edit this bit out now, or at <laughs> least put it as an outtake. If I put it as an outtake, then we know that you know she was really committed to listen to the full conversation. Yeah, that's very true.